Welcome to High Lakes, where we gather all of us, young, old, rich, poor, those who are close and those who feel far from God. We join each of us together at a different stage of our journey of faith. We don't exist to make our own name great, but to make God's name great. We exist to show Jesus to those who've been outcast, those who've been forgotten, and those who have walked away from God. We exist for those who have a past and have moved away from God. We exist to never make church complex, but to make it simple. We gather every week, not as individuals, but as a family, pushing and striving towards the same thing, knowing that Jesus was not for the select few, but he was for everyone. We believe that Jesus was the Son of God who lived a sinless life and shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. We believe that Jesus is the hope of the world, a light shining in the darkness. We believe that we choose today who we will be today will determine what the world and community will be like tomorrow. We have a mission, to be called to discipleship and community, to bring our best in excellence and worship, to be hospitable to all and always have our doors open to whoever who would come through them, to be a people of generosity for the world, to the hurting, to the lost and the broken, where as a family we can work together to bring light to the darkest corners of the earth. Our vision is to be the church that God calls us to be, to be a church for Lapine and for the community and the world around us. High Lakes is not just a building, it's a movement of people who are making the bold claim, this is for everyone. Well, good morning. Welcome to High Lakes. Whether you're here in the room or you're online with us, we're glad that you are here with us at church. We have an exciting morning for you. There's a lot going on around the church. As you saw when you came in, we're not leaving this style the same. We're not staying with like an open wood floor. We have carpet going in tomorrow, so that's really, really cool. Thank you for all those who came and volunteered their time to rip out all that carpet in this last week. That was awesome. Saved us lots of time and money. We're so grateful for that. Um, but we got a ton of great things taking place. Right now, we have a team in Mexico right now that's doing some missions work down there, and they're going to um, be, be down there for about a whole week, long time, so be praying for them. We also just got back from middle school and high school camp. We took 35 students up there uh, to uh, Round Lake, and we baptized five of them yesterday, which is awesome. It was a great and exciting time. Thank you for your prayers for that, but also the, the people that came and helped out and cooked for people and, and the volunteers over there. So if you see Isaac, he might be asleep, okay, in service, and that's completely okay. Youth pastors get a, get a break after their event. They get one sleeping service a, a, a year, and, and it's that one. So, um, Actually, he's working in the nursery today, which gives me another announcement. The nursery is open, available today. We're, we're going to have in a minute is the kids' service is also going to happen. They're doing a, a camp theme for the summer. So we'll do the first three songs, and then I'm going to send those kids out after those three songs, and then we'll sing one more song together after that. But how about you stand up? Give somebody uh, a handshake or a hug and, and just let them know you're glad that they are here today. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain. And as I walk, and as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe in you. So when I fight, so when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, battle me. And 
if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes. When all I see are the ashes, you see my beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In almighty fortress, you go before us. Yes, he does. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. Stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, so when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay in your feet, I sink through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay in your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. You got a hand this morning. The battle belongs to him. And Lord, I come, Lord, I confess, I'm bowing here, I find my rest without you. I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Sing that again, Lord, I come. And Lord, I come. Lord, I confess. Bowing near, I find my rest. And without you, You're the one that guides my heart, yeah. And Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you, my one defense. Thank you. 
teach my songs to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand or fall on you, and Jesus, you're my open stage. So teach my songs to rise to you. And when temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand or fall on you, in Jesus, you're my open stay. Lord, I need you. And Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Confirm that today, Amen. And
a thousand generations, your family, your children, and their children. Just keep singing that as the kids head out. They're going to head out to the, their kids' time right now. Your family, your children, your children. Four-year-olds through fifth grade, go ahead and head your way down the hallway there. Lord, I pray that we can be 
the hands and the feet of Jesus in our life. God, that from this place, we can take the blessing that's been given to us and we take that to the world around us, God, that we become light, we become salt to the world, that you would be made known, God, that because of our love for each other and our love for one another, that the world will see that and know that you are God. And God, we pray for that in a mighty way for the city of Lapine. God, that you, your presence, your spirit would be so powerful inside of our community that people would start to wonder, well, what is going on down the street at that church? God, we want, we want to be a part of that. Lord, we pray that that would take place, God. We know that you are able. We know that you are mighty. God, because you went to the cross and you died for us, you came in flesh. You came as a human. You, you, you came as God. And in that time, you lived a sinless and perfect life and you died on the cross for us. Lord, I pray that we would remember that as we come to the time of communion and hearing the word today, God, that we would be open to what you have to say to us, God. Thank you for being with us this, this morning. Thank you for being with us this week. It's in your name that we do pray. Amen. You may be seated. Feel free to grab that little communion cup as you do that. Take the little top off of there. his Holy Spirit, and his Holy Word. The Olympic gold medal pales in comparison to the prize that we receive when we put our faith in Christ and finish the race. In him, we have the victory and defeat death and have our name recorded in the record book called the Book of Life. Paul, the Apostle Paul, addresses this in 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. I'd like to read that. It reads, verse 7, I have fought, I, I can't hardly see here for a minute, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. We can thank God for giving us Jesus and the tools we need to win that race. When we partake in communion, we do this in remembrance of the body and blood of Jesus that was broken and poured out on the cross. Taking communion not only reminds us of his suffering, but also shows us the amount of love Jesus had for us. We thank him for providing a way for us to win that race. Let's just take a moment and reflect on what Jesus did for us on that cross and the goodness that he 
provides for us. So let's just bow our heads and take a moment. Our communion scripture this morning is 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Verse 23 reads, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. Lord, we just... Once again, we just thank you. How can we ever thank you enough, Lord, for what you did on that brutal cross? We thank you for providing a way for us to salvation and having a way to win that race, Lord. We just praise you. We know everything good comes from you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. How many of you, the older you get, you feel what you did yesterday more and more, right? Yeah, Steve, two hands up, yeah. When you wake up in the morning and uh, you're walking with a limp, you know what that is? Well, it's old-itis, but, uh, but what that is is it's your whole body compensating and hurting with another member of your body. And this morning, my heart is heavy for a part of the body of Christ, a guy by the name of Alan Campbell. He's a good friend and a great brother in Christ, and he's, he's critical condition right now at St. Charles. And so I think it'd be appropriate, as the Apostle Paul says, when one part of the body hurts, the rest of the body hurts with that person. And our brother Alan needs our prayers. So you bow with me. Let's have a word of prayer for our brother Alan. Lord. You've created the body of Christ because life is hard and the Christian life is even harder. And Lord, our brother Alan right now needs you. And so in the name of Jesus, we lift him up to you right now for your healing touch on his life. God, we know that uh, you're a God of mercy. And as his life hangs in the balance, Lord, we know that you will pour your grace out on him and do what is merciful for him, Lord. And we ask right now, God, as his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, that your healing would come to him and that your peace that passes understanding would be on him even at this moment. That he would sense as if all of us were in that ICU room, Lord, not in a scary way, but in a supportive way, Lord, that we're up there pulling for him, that we're praying for him, that we love him and we care for him. And Lord, I pray the same for for his wife, Connie, and all of his family right now that are here in this community as well. God, I pray for your peace that passes understanding to be on them. Again, we ask for your healing for Alan today in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Well, if you turn in your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 11, this morning we're continuing our series titled Heroes. And the hero that we're looking at today is a guy by the name of Moses. So stick a finger there in Hebrews chapter 11 and then flip back to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2 is kind of where we get the actual story of what happened. So Exodus chapter 2 gives us the story of Moses and Hebrews chapter 11 gives us kind of a New Testament commentary on that story of Moses. Well, the Nile crocodiles were licking their chops as the bloodthirsty 
king of Egypt, a guy named Pharaoh, had made an edict. The Hebrew people had been enslaved for 400 years, and they had become so numerous that the people of Egypt were worried that eventually the, the Hebrew people might outnumber the Egyptian people and might overpower them in a battle someday. And so the king of Egypt made an edict, and he said, every baby boy born to the Hebrews is to be thrown where? In the Nile River. How many of you have ever had a special child? You should all be raising your hand if you have children. They're all special children, right? And every parent thinks so. But when Moses' parents saw him, they realized he was not an ordinary child. They realized he was something special. Now, this wasn't just parental bias. How many of you have parental bias? You think your kids, I, have, I think my kids are the greatest kids on the planet, right? But they recognized that God had something special in mind. For Moses. Oh, that we would see in our kids not just a beautiful child, but a child that's anointed by God to be a great kingdom worker. And because they saw that there was something special about Moses, uh, they made him a basket case. Um, they took a basket and they covered it with pitch and they followed the king's command by throwing him in the Nile River, but they put him in a little basket covered with pitch, and then they sat at a distance to see what would happen to this gifted and anointed little child, Moses. I'm sure that his sister, as she watched there from the reeds, was holding her breath as she watched none other than the, the daughter of the Pharaoh of Egypt come down to the water's edge to bathe with her attendants that morning. She looked among the reeds, and she heard maybe the soft cry of a baby and she sent her servants to go fetch that little basket. And as they opened it, there was this beautiful, beautiful child. And apparently it wasn't just parental bias because he was so incredible that even though she knew he was a Hebrew baby and she knew what her father's edict was, she said, I'm keeping this one. How many of you like what's happening in higher education today in terms of what they're teaching our young people. How many of you like what's happening? Not many hands are going up because it looks more like indoctrination than it does look like education. How many of you would agree with me? Moses was raised in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. This anointed child was then immersed not only as a basket case in the water, but he was immersed as a basket case among Pharaoh's household, and he was trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. That's where we pick up the story in Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. Moses is raised in the wisdom of the Egyptians, and as he grew older, here's what takes place in the life of Moses. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. One day... After Moses had grown up, he went out to watch where his own people were. And he watched them at their hard labor, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting, and he asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? In other words, who died and left you in charge? How many of you have used that on your siblings before? Yeah. What, what right do you have to be judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian where he sat down at a well. Moses' actions here are commented on by Stephen in the book of Acts chapter 7, where Moses had a calling from the Lord. Remember I said he was a beautiful child, he was anointed by God, and Moses, even at this young adult age, was, was called of God, anointed by God to deliver Israel. And Stephen says of Moses, he has, gives us a little bit of insight into Moses' frame of mind here. Moses felt called of God to deliver the people of Israel. And Stephen says that Moses thought the people of Israel would know that God had called him. Well, guess what? They didn't. They didn't see what Moses was doing as a favor to them. In fact, they even threatened him. They told him that what he had done had become known. 
And Stephen seems to suggest that Moses' actions were based in the belief that God had called him to deliver Israel from slavery. Now let's see how the writer of Hebrews, turn to Hebrews chapter 11, let's see how the writer of Hebrews comments on this very event in the life of Moses. It's interesting how all the Bible kind of ties together. There's these different parts of the Bible that talk about the same story. And here's what the writer of Hebrews says about Moses. Now again, the series we're talking about is loosely based off of Hebrews 11, where we're looking at snapshots of heroes of the faith. And I want us to learn the lessons we can learn from the faith of Moses. So here's verse 24, Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, Talking about that Exodus 2 ch chapter, right? When Moses had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because, and here's the kicker, because he was looking ahead to his reward. Moses is a faith hero. He's held up by the writer of Hebrews as a model for us, not because of what he said, but because of what he did. And I wonder today, how many of us, if it was only based on your actions and not your words, just your actions, would there be enough evidence to convict you that you're a follower of Christ? Moses' actions spoke louder than his words. Notice he doesn't, he doesn't verbally identify with the people of God here. He simply takes action when he sees them being oppressed by the Egyptian slave masters. Now let's see this Moses as he springs into action. And the first thing about Moses' example of faith for us to follow is that by faith, Moses renounced the allure of earth in favor of a heavenly reward. That's what the writer tells us. That in faith, he was able to see beyond the circumstances of the moment. And he was able to do this thing that was very popular in early Christianity, but is not popular today. The theological word called renunciation, okay? Moses renounced his princehood with Egypt in order to identify with the people of God. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ for a moment, right? This great thing we celebrate at Christmas, we call it the incarnation. It's where Jesus renounces his divinity in some respect. He leaves heaven's throne and he becomes one of us, right? He condescends. He comes down onto our level. We call it the incarnation. Moses did the same thing. He renounced his, his, his status in the royal family, and he became one of his own people. He incarnated among them. It would have been really easy for Moses to say, hey, I'm a prince of Egypt. What do I care about the rest of these people? Right? I got it made in the shade. Their suffering doesn't affect me. I could continue on as if nothing had ever happened, but God's call to us is always to lay aside our comfort, to lay aside our security, to lay aside our privilege, and to incarnate and to identify with the suffering. Isn't that what Jesus did? Jesus laid aside his divinity and he identified with not just humanity, with suffering humanity. And he suffered in the very worst way possible, the Roman torture of death on a cross. Jesus laid all that aside for us. And Moses is held up as an example of faith because he renounced earth's allure for his heavenly reward. He answered the call. He renounced this princely privilege and power and pleasure, and instead he chose solidarity with the people of God. Well, what does this look like in our modern world? Well, I'll give you a couple of examples of what it isn't like, and maybe that'll help you understand. The first example is from a guy in the early church by the name of Simeon the Stylite. Let me tell you a little bit about Simeon the Stylite. He was 13 years old. He had just read the Beatitudes. By the way, he, was, he lived around 400 A.D., so we're talking 350 years after Christ, right? And so he had just read the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the humble, etc. He had read that passage, and he decided that he was going to dedicate his life to Jesus. Any young people here 13? Any 13-year-olds? One, we've got two, two hands, three hands, maybe some in the back there. At your age, he decided, I'm going to dedicate my life to Jesus, all right? Now, of course, Roman persecution by that point was pretty much gone by the wayside. So how would you prove how serious you were about your faith in Jesus? For those people, they called it a white martyrdom. It was to enter a monastery. And so at the age of 16, he entered a monastery. Now, 
You know it's bad when your practices, your spiritual practices are so extreme that the monastery kicks you out. But that's what happened to Simeon the Stylite. He was so extreme in his devotion to Jesus and in his, his, um, his denunciation and renunciation of all physical pleasures that they kicked him out of the monastery. So he said, okay, well, um, I guess I'll go live in a secluded hut for a while. Now, you, some of you young people have just come through COVID, right? A year and a half, just like this last year, where you had to live in your house. Imagine living in a hut with nobody else, not even your family, not your brothers and sisters. You live in a hut for a year and a half. On top of that, Simeon also decided that for the entire time of Lent, which is about six weeks, he went six weeks, 40 days he went, and he said, I'm not going to eat or drink anything for 40 days. For 40 days. It's not physically possible, by the way, so don't try this at home, okay? You, you can't go 40 days without water. You can go 40 days without food, but not water. Which caused everyone to believe when he, ex when he, when he came out of that, that time of, of Lent in that hut, everybody hailed it as a miracle that he was still alive because he'd gone 40 days, supposedly, without food or water. That's how extreme he was. Well, um, he, would, he would stand uh, as long as he could. He would, he, would, he would abuse his body. He would stand as long as he could, as long as his legs. He would try to sleep standing up. I mean, I, I grew up on a farm. I know cows and horses. They got four legs. They can sleep standing up, but we can't, right? This guy would try to sleep standing up. He was, he was just extreme in his devotion to the Lord and all these things that he tried to do. Well, after he, he, he came out of his hut seclusion, um, he, he, found a, uh, he found a cave. And he decided to live in that cave for a while, in the cold, in the cave, but the problem was that he was so popular, his teaching was so popular, and he was so devoted to the Lord that pilgrims would come from all over the place and try to find him and sought him out for his wisdom and his incredible life of prayer. It caused the cave to get really crowded after a while, and he decided, you know what, this isn't working. i got to find something else. And so he found the ancient ruins of a city near Aleppo, Syria. There was a 50-foot-high pillar that was remaining from those ruins near Aleppo, Syria, and he climbed this 50-foot pillar where there was a three-foot by three-foot platform on top of this pillar, and that's where he decided to live out the remainder of his days. Imagine that, three-foot by three-foot on top of a pillar, and pilgrims would come from all over the Roman Empire, and they would come and seek his wisdom and seek his prayers for them as well. He was so devoted to the Lord. Thirty-seven years Simeon the Stylite lived on a three-foot by three-foot platform. Now, it's said that the, that the boys and girls from the village would bring him their leftovers, and they would pull it up to, he would pull it up in a bucket, and he would eat it. Now, I don't know what he did for an outhouse, but I hope it wasn't the same bucket he was pulling up the leftovers in. I, I, don't, I don't want to try to image what, how he, I, I, it's just, okay. He lived on top of this pillar 37 years, 50 feet in the air. Can you imagine? Summertime, no shade. Wintertime, no heat. He lived up on top of this pillar. Um, the story goes that when he finally passed away, that he was so dedicated to a posture of prayer that he actually died in a posture of prayer. Can you imagine you're one of the pilgrims and you've come to seek the wisdom of Simeon the Stylite and you look up there and he's, he's in this long posture of prayer and you're thinking, man, he is so spiritual. And for days... He's still in that posture of prayer. And I wonder who it was that drew the short straw that said, maybe we should go up and check on him. Uh, a wellness check, right? I mean, but, and he, he had passed away in a posture of prayer. One extreme example, right? Now, don't look for me to be climbing any 50-foot pillars anytime soon. I like my family too much to move out to one of those. How about this couple that's on the screen behind me? This couple right here. Um, they've recently made headlines in 2020 when they renounced the royal family right? Prince Harry, uh, Princess Meghan, they renounced the royal family. And they, with that, they renounced the millions and millions of dollars that they had coming to them as members of the royal family. Now, I'm sure that all of you are, um, have been wringing your hands with concern over whether Harry and Meghan are doing okay financially. In fact, a lot of people are because I Googled it. It was a, a great search that came up. And there's actually been studies and hypotheses that have shown what they're doing for a living now since they've had to become commoners like the rest of us and actually go to work for a living. Mm, nah, not so fast. Google search will show you that studies show that between 
that their, their net worth right now is still between 10 and probably more likely closer to 50 to 60 million dollars. I'm sure that you're uh, happy to know that they're doing okay. You can stop wringing your hands now. This is the kind of renouncement that we like in the Western church. I'm going to renounce my royalty, renounce my wealth. Never mind that I still have $50 million in the bank. We, want, we like our comfort, don't we? And that's what renouncement looks like for many of us. We renounce, but we don't renounce. We still pursue our own financial gain. But that's not what it looked like for Moses. He chose to identify with the suffering people of God rather than to enjoy, the writer of Hebrews says, the pleasures of of sin for a season. And God's call is like that for all of us. To give up ourselves on behalf of other people. Several of the young people sitting in the front row here today have recently made a decision to be baptized into Christ. Pretty exciting. That's coming up in just a few days. But one of the things that you need to understand about that decision is that when you go down into that water, we say these words over the people that we baptize, we say, buried with Jesus, and raised to walk a new life. That means that the old self, the old lives, the old selfish pleasures and pursuits that you used to go after are now buried with Jesus, and you're raised to walk a new life. I was talking with a guy a couple of weeks ago, and he said, man, I, I'm thinking about baptism, but he goes, I'm really weighing this decision heavily, and here's why. He said, because I know that the moment I go underneath that water, I have just lost myself. And in some ways, that is absolutely true. That's what the Bible talks about. It's a death, a burial, and a resurrection. When you young people, when you go underneath that water, if you're contemplating that decision right now, when you go underneath that water, there is a spiritual reality that takes place, and the old life of sin is buried, and you're raised to walk in a new life. And that is the renouncement that Moses made as he began to lead the people of God. When he answered the call of Christ to lead the people of God, to leave his old life, to leave his privilege, to leave his comfort, and to follow God into the homes of the least of these, the suffering of humanity. One of the greatest challenges of the Christian life is to trade earth's tangibles for heaven's intangibles, to trade what we can see and feel for what we can only see through the eyes of Living a life of self-denial and self-sacrifice based on faith that God will reward us later, that's hard stuff. That's where the rubber meets the road. Will we accept that call? One of the biggest things that we were, were, were called to sacrifice right out of the get-go is our comfort. It's not going to be comfortable for you. Jesus says if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. The call of renunciation to trade the tangibles of safety, comfort, security, and prosperity for the intangibles, that which we cannot see. The reward of heaven is the hardest part. Now, um, our lives on earth may not be as posh as, as Princess Meghan and Prince Harry, but the Lord calls us to a renunciation. It might not be as extreme as Simeon, but I want to look at a few examples of what this might look like in your life. Some of them are from my own life. Some are from people I know. One of the things for Angie and I, and I've mentioned this before, but one of the things for us is we've traded the tangibility of a second income in order to invest in our kids. Not to say you can't if you have a second income, but one of the things for us is dedicating one whole parent all the time to making sure that we are investing in our kids so that they will hopefully, this is through the eyes of faith, mind you, that they will, through the eyes of faith, turn out better. And what I mean by better is not that they will be more financially secure, not that they'll have worldly wealth, but so that they will be on the Jesus train. They will be kingdom workers for the kingdom of Jesus. And guess what? It's working. It's not perfect. How many of you have noticed kids don't come with a guarantee? I wish they did. But eventually they become adults and they start making decisions of their own. And many of us as parents have had to live with that heartache because we've made that sacrifice through the eyes of faith and it didn't turn out the way we hoped it would. The question is, even if it doesn't work, will we still trust the Lord? Will we still make those sacrifices? Another example, obviously we all know that ministry and missions 
are the most lucrative business venture in the modern world, correct? Uh, no, no, they're not. In fact, if you answer the call to ministry or to missions as a life calling, as a vocation in your life, right? If you answer that call, I can promise you, well, you're not going to be wealthy, most likely, unless you somehow inherit a fortune from Harry and Meghan, and I don't think that they're probably going to pass their wealth on to you, right? It's a call, it's an inherent no to the goods of this world, and it's an inherent yes to the intangible reward that waits us in heaven. I'll give you another example. Um, some of you, three years ago, three and a half years ago now almost, when we asked you to make a sacrificial gift in order to help us build a building that will hopefully be a tool for ministry for generations to come, and many of you said, yeah. I can see through the eyes of faith what at that time three years ago only existed in our minds, didn't it? But the Lord has provided. And we're almost finished. Not much longer. There's a couple things. One is the water tank to hook up to the sprinkler system that's holding back the use of that almost finished building. Obviously, we got a crew together and we tore out all the carpet in here because this week, new carpet's going down. It's going to look brand new when you come in next week, Lord willing, unless there's any more delays. But some of you answered that call and you said, I'm going to give something tangible of mine. And, and if you're like me, you can think of 15 other things that you would really like to have with that money. But instead, you made that sacrifice because you believed in the invisible kingdom of God. Some of you also um, have given up things like promotions at work for extra time so that you can lead a, a Bible study or you can um, be involved in the youth ministry or some other ministry within the church. Um, there's a picture up on the screen behind me here of our, of our Mexico team. They left Friday, and, and Kyle just texted me, and here's what he said. He said, um, he said we uh, let me know, I'm letting you know that we made it safe yesterday across the border. All went well so far. Thank you all for your prayers this week. These people are ordinary people like you and I from this church family, many of whom have full-time jobs, and they have given up a week and a half of their vacation in order to go and do this. Not because they don't need a week and a half of vacation, not because they don't have anything better to do with their time, but because they see the invisible kingdom of Jesus, the reward that awaits them, and they said, you know what? We're going to sacrifice of ourselves in order to be the hands and feet of Jesus to the people of Mexico and to bring the good news of salvation to them. Will you keep them in prayer with me this week as they go down there? Some of you have chosen to follow Jesus, knowing that it would cost you your reputation in the community as a Jesus freak. Many of you young people here, when you make that decision and you say, hey, I, I'm a follower of Jesus, guess what? It's going to make you very unpopular with some of your friends. You're going to have to sacrifice your reputation. What do you think happened to Moses when he said, you know what? Thanks, but no thanks, Pharaoh. Thanks, but no thanks, Pharaoh's daughter. I'm no longer a prince anymore. I'm going to identify with these people over here who are suffering. What do you think his family thought of him at that point? Probably rejected him. And we can expect the same thing. But Matthew chapter 19, Jesus says, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Can you see it today? Can you see the trade that you're making. That is a great motivation to say, okay, Lord, I will give up what I cannot keep in order to gain what I cannot lose. This is a quote from one of my favorite missionaries of all time, a guy by the name of Jim Elliott. Though Jim Elliott had taken a wife, he was in love with his wife, he was excited to have a family and all these things, he heard the call of God to go to Ecuador and to witness the gospel of Jesus to a cannibalistic and difficult tribe who all of his friends warned him, it's dangerous, be careful, don't go there. But he and three other courageous men flew onto a gravel bar in the jungles of Ecuador. And when they got off the plane, they were speared to death by the Aka Indians, who the very people they had sacrificed to bring the gospel to. Jim Elliott, just a few weeks before he left on that trip, said these words, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. There's a the rest of the story to it, though. His wife, Elizabeth, who had just lost her husband to these, uh, these Ecuadorians, 
Guess what she did? She got on a plane and went back down there. And eventually she shared the gospel with the very people who had killed her husband. And they all became followers of Jesus because they persevered. Because she could see through the eyes of faith that there's a reward that awaits that is even worth the cost of our very lives if that's what it comes to. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Notice verse 27. It's not the only thing that Moses renounced. It says, by faith, verse 27, he left Egypt not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. The second thing that Moses' example uh, for us to follow is that Moses feared God more than he feared people. How much pressure do you think it would have put on Moses to recognize that Pharaoh had it out for him? Pharaoh knew where Moses had grown up. Pharaoh most likely knew Moses' family. And if Moses didn't get the heck out of Dodge, Moses would no longer be around. How many of you have noticed that the culture around us and the people in power around us are putting lots and lots of pressure on us to capitulate to the culture around us? How hard is it to speak truth to power in a modern age right now? And Moses fled from Pharaoh and I want you to, I want you to see, hear this nuance here because I'm not so sure that Moses was afraid of Pharaoh. I think what Moses was afraid of was that if Moses were to be killed by Pharaoh, who then would God raise up to deliver the people of Israel? Moses had a sense of his calling. He knew that God had called him to deliver Israel. And if Moses fails in his mission, there is no plan B. The writer of Hebrews says it wasn't that Moses was afraid of Pharaoh as much as it was that Moses was afraid of failing his mission. And so Moses fled into Midian, where for 40 years Moses persevered, believing still that he was anointed until that fateful day when he saw a bush burning in the distance as he was tending his father-in-law's flock, and the Lord spoke to him out of the burning bush and said, Moses, I have indeed heard the misery of of my people, and I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you might tell him to let my people go. Stephen reminds us that Moses experienced a calling to deliver the people of God before he even left for, for Midian. And my experience has been that when God calls you to something, just like David, David was anointed king over Israel, but it would be many years before he would actually take the throne. And sometimes God calls us, he anoints us, but then there's many years where we have to persevere in faith, sometimes groping in the dark at times until God brings about that moment where we are to be called of him to do what he, is, he called us to initially. Obedience to this call always requires a perseverance, a trust to continue to move ahead in spite of all the challenges and obstacles. Moses was 40 years old when God called him. Guess how old he was when he finally went back to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. 80 years old. For 40 years in the wilderness, Moses persevered in that calling of God until God called him once again. By the way, Moses feared God more than he feared people. But it didn't mean it was going to be smooth sailing. When God said to Moses, Moses, I want you to go and speak to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And you know what Moses said to God? God, why me? Um, isn't there somebody else more qualified? How many of you have argued with God before? <laughs> why me? There's got to be somebody else out there that's more qualified than me. There's got to be somebody else out there that is a good public speaker. There's got to be somebody else out there that has the boldness and the courage to do this. Just because Moses wasn't afraid of Pharaoh doesn't mean Moses didn't have fear. And fear and faith are not, they're not opposites, right? Oftentimes, we are stepping in the midst of our fears in order to act in faith, and that's what Moses had to do. He had to step into his fear, and that was his act of faith. Why? Because Moses saw him who is unseen. I don't think he's talking about the burning bush experience here. The burning bush experience doesn't come till the very end of Moses' sojourn in the desert. Right? I think what the writer is saying is that just as Hebrews chapter 11 starts out this way, Faith is the confidence in what we hope for, the assurance about what we do not see. The writer is commending Moses, not because Moses saw God physically, but because Moses did what all of us have to do, that we lift our eyes off the plane of our circumstances, we fixate on the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and we walk ahead in faith, even though we're sometimes afraid. Remember Peter, when he was out on the storm with Jesus, and Jesus comes walking on the water, and Peter says, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come and walk, to, walk with you on the water. And Jesus said, come, Peter. So Peter gets out of the boat. He starts walking towards Jesus. And as long as Peter's eyes were fixated on Jesus, he was fine. But the moment that he started taking his eye, eyes off of Jesus and he started looking at the waves and the wind and the fear and the chaos that surrounded him, what happens to him? He begins to sink, doesn't he? And the reason that Moses could persevere in faith is because he kept his eyes fixed on him who was unseen. Isn't it kind of an oxymoron? You fix your eyes on what is unseen. But that's the truth about who Moses was, and that's the example that he gives us. There's a third thing. Read on with me to verse 28, chapter 11, verse 28. By faith, Moses, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. The third thing about Moses' example to us to, for us to follow is that Moses had faith in the blood of the Lamb applied to his own life. Passover was by far the most powerful and memorable, memorable event in Israel's history. In fact, eventually, the Lord would call the people of Israel to make this Passover feast an annual holiday, a celebration of the mighty hand and the outstretched arm of God that came down and delivered his people from bondage in, in Egypt. It was the night that God took every, told every household to take a male lamb from their flock, a one-year-old without defect, and at twilight, every household was to slaughter that lamb, drain its blood into a bowl, and then roast that lamb whole over the fire, and they were to eat that entire lamb that evening. Yum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I'd be singing. I'd be super excited. They ate this entire lamb together. They weren't to leave any of it until morning, but that night they were to take a, a hyssop plant, like an ancient paintbrush. They were to dip it in the lamb's blood, and they were to smear it on the doorposts, the top and the sides of every Israelite household. Can you picture their Egyptian neighbors? What's with these guys? These guys have lost their marbles. You ever felt like you were doing something that didn't make any sense, but you were like, pretty sure God's leading me here. I know it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and your friends and your neighbors and maybe people around you, you young people at school, when you have certain values because you're following after Jesus and your friends are scratching their head going, what, what gives with these people? They're weird, Right? But they had faith that what God had told them to do, there was a purpose behind it. And so they painted the blood on the door frames of their houses. They ate the Passover lamb that night. And God said this, he said, tonight, in the middle of the night, there's going to be an angel sent from God, and he's going to pass over the entire land of Egypt. And in every household, he is going to strike down the firstborn of every household in the land. Every household he's going to strike, and you're probably thinking to yourself, man, that is, that's bloodthirsty. But God said this, he said, the reason is because Pharaoh will not let my firstborn son, Israel, go. And if Pharaoh will refuse me what I've asked of him, then this is what's going to happen. And then God said this to Moses, he said, those that have the blood painted on the door frames of their houses, I will pass over. That's why it's called Passover. I will pass over the homes of the Israelite people so that everyone in Egypt will know that I make a distinction between the Egyptians and my people Israel. They painted the blood on the doorposts of their houses. In the close-up window of the bifocals, Passover represents God's powerful deliverance from slavery. 400 years the Israelites had been in bondage to Egypt their slavery from Egypt. That's in the close-up of the bifocal. But in the distant lens, in the distant lens, if they lift their eyes to the future, it's a foreshadowing of the blood of Christ, the sacrificial lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, the scripture says. Our sacrifice, our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, through his blood applied to our lives, we are released from the bondage of sin. I can't tell you how many people, story after story after story, I've listened to as they said, you know what? I never had freedom until I found a relationship 
with Jesus. When the blood was applied to my life, I became a follower of Jesus. And from then on, everything changed. Everything changed from then on. It's because they were released from their bondage, their slavery, their addictions, their sin. When that blood is applied to your life, we're spared, not only we're released from that bondage, but we're also spared the judgment of death that comes to all people. If you put yourself in Moses and the Israelite shoes, painting these blood on the door frames of their homes with the, the hyssop plant, I'm sure it made zero sense. Even to the people of God, they were probably, this doesn't make any sense, but what they could not see was what would later happen in the future when Jesus Christ, who in the shape of of that same shape of the door frames of the houses would be crucified. His blood would be spilled from both, both wrists as he was nailed to the cross. The crown of thorns caused his head to bleed on the back of the cross. And now in this same shape of the blood on the back of the door frame, the, the header as well as on the sides, Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, shed his blood on our behalf. That's what it foreshadowed. I wonder today, is the blood applied to your life? Oh, the world is going to look at that whole story of Jesus about the crucifixion, the resurrection, the fact that Jesus gave his life on behalf of humanity. He was God in the flesh and became one of us. He condescended and came down to us so that he could save us from sin. The rest of the world looks at it and goes, ah, a bunch of fairy tales. Doesn't make any sense to them. But I wonder today, have you applied the blood of Jesus to your life? As Aaron comes up to sing us a, a closing song and an invitation song, I want to ask you, this morning, if you have faith as Moses did in the blood of the Passover lamb applied to your life. Moses could have easily said, well, that's a real nice plan, God. I believe in all of that. But it was his action. It was his actions to actually apply that blood to his own life, to the door frames of his own houses that spared even Moses' own son. What about you today? Have you applied the blood of Christ to your life, your Passover lamb. You can do that by making a decision today to be baptized into Christ by turning your life and your will over to the one who is able to take control of your whole life. You can be baptized into Christ and enter a new way of life. Buried with Jesus, the old life of sin is gone. The blood washes over you and cleanses you and you can be raised to walk in a new life. Maybe there's someone in this room who will follow the boldness and the example of some of these young people in the front row who sat down with someone at the end of this week and said, you know what? I need that in my life. If you're, if you're maybe slightly older than some of these teenagers in the front row, don't let them outdo you in your boldness. Maybe you've never had a chance to make that decision to apply that blood to your life. We give you that opportunity this morning as we sing this song. Would you stand with us and sing this invitation about how much we need the Lord and His incredible sacrifice for us? Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need Lord, I need you. And Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. And every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. up here. Dave and Diane, come on up here. I'm going to attempt something I don't always attempt, especially with a spelling like your last name. Um, this is Dave and Diane, and I'm going to see if I can get this right. Winecheck? Winesack. 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 Difficult spelling, great people. And, uh, <laughs> and, and these, these two people have come forward today just to say, we want this to be our church home. Um, and Dave and Diane were elders at, uh, at a church over in the, in the Willamette Valley for many years in Tigard. And uh, they're just a great couple, a great addition to our church family. 
and we're excited to welcome you guys here today. So uh, thank you guys for, for making that bold decision. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a very simple confession that unites all of us, um, and that confession is the confession that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, and he's the one that you're walking and following after. Um, is that true in both of you today? Yes, it is. Well, that's, that's as simple as it is, really. We're, we're a simple church that goes by the Bible, and we unite under the lordship of Jesus. And so um, these two come to us as people who've been following Christ for a long time, and we're looking forward to seeing what the Lord does with you here in Lapine. So very exciting, even though you live a little bit north of here, but that's okay. That's okay. We still love you and accept you. So. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer for them and welcome them uh, to the church family this morning. Lord, uh, thank you for Dave and Diane today. Thank you for their, their love for you. Um, thank you for their boldness today to say, yeah, uh, we want to we wanna be uh, a member of this church family, Lord. Um, and Father, uh, many times becoming part of a body of Christ is an act of faith, much like what Moses did. Um, because becoming part of the body means that when the body hurts, we hurt. And when the body mourns, we mourn. When the body needs help, we help. And Father, uh, it's an act of sacrifice. And so I pray for them, Lord, that um, you will show them the ways that you want to involve them in ministry and mission here with us at High Lakes Christian. Lord, I pray that their lives would be fruitful, Father, that you would use them for your kingdom glory, and there'd be people won to Christ, people discipled up to be strong followers of you, ministers for your kingdom, Lord, because Dave and Diane have chosen to offer their gifts here as part of our body, Lord. Bless them today for this decision. And Father, uh, thank you for them. We welcome them in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's give them a hand as they go back to their seat. Very cool. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Well, let's have a quick closing word of prayer, and uh, you're dismissed. Lord, thank you for today. Uh, thank you for the example of Moses. Father, as we go out these doors, may we walk in that faith-filled example that he leaves for us, Lord. Um, Father, help us to live a life of sacrifice for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.